Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to some of the best thriller writers in the world. But now, after nearly two and a half years, I think it's time I toot my own horn. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale. This thriller stars Hollywood detective Patricia Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat when one of Hollywood's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home. The only problem, the star just won an Oscar and is found dead only hours later. Now, Pat sees this as a way to forge her own path and muscles her way into the case. Soon, she and partner Detective Stuart Brown find themselves deep inside a complex case with more questions and answers and a ghost of a killer. Now, this isn't my first self-published book, but it's the first one I'm very confident you're going to like. I'm pretty proud of it. And for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only $5.95 or the paperback for $13.95. Now, since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this a way to help out your fellow thriller author. Okay, here's the link. DavidTempleBooks.com slash books. Okay, there you'll see the poser. Just click and you're on your way. Again, the link is DavidTempleBooks.com slash books. Otherwise, just head over to Amazon. Okay, thanks for your support. And now on with the show. Hello and welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple, here in Season 3. Welcome aboard. As you can see, the booth to the studio is open, which means work is done. On today's show, I am thrilled to welcome a guy that I've been following from a distance for some time. His name is Brian Freeman, and his book is The Born Sacrifice. Are you a Robert Ludlum fan? Well, then you're going to love this book. As you hear me talking with Brian here shortly, this book is going to be in my top 10 summer reads of this summer. I'll go into greater detail inside the show, but it is a doozy. Uh, As you're going to find out, I don't know how many times I've seen the Bourne movies time and time and time again, but classics like that just never get tired anyway without any further ado brian is in the green room so let's get busy welcome to the thriller zone mr brian freeman thank you i'm happy to be here this is an exciting time by the way let me throw this in here we're going to get to uh, born sacrifice very shortly i have many things to say about it <laughs> i'm i'm just happy to, to see the book i don't even have my own copies yet so uh, I'm, I'm i'm excited to see it i've been i've been seeing that cover for a few months now and i love it so you don't have a copy i don't have a copy myself no i've i've uh, i've i've got the first two here but uh, but no i don't have my own copy of sacrifice yet <laughs> wow i i don't know whether to feel badly or better that i beat you on something but that's that that's okay. I, I did have kind of a sneak preview when I wrote it. So <laughs> nice little thing they do for your book. They put your initials right in the middle. Did you know I, that? I, I've seen that. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I, I, I love it. it it's, it's funny. Every now and then publishers do really interesting things on the inner inner jacket. A lot of times I don't actually notice it until someone tells me about it because I typically don't remove the jacket. So Oh yeah. I'm I'm one of those freaks that loves I love the covers. I love the, you know, I spend a lot of time looking at uh, uh, who designs them and so forth. And we've got a couple of, there's one that, um, if I can just go off on a tangent here, looking at some of your books, um, and I, we're going to talk about Born Sacrifice, of course, but yep. there's one that you're getting ready to release in August called um, Don't, Don't. I Remember You. Yeah. I love that cover. That is so cool. Isn't that great? Yeah. Let me, let me, let me, I'll, uh, one second. I'll, I'll show it to you. Here. Oh, good. See, I love show and tell. Yeah, exactly. There we go. See, now I have, I remember you. So <laughs> yeah, See, isn't that the, a cool cover? That's really, really striking. The way the city just drips. And uh, I got to admit, Brian, uh, and again, this is all about born sacrifice, but then again, it's all about you. So, <laughs> but I would, I started, I went. I was, you know, doing a little follow up on your website, and I went to your Amazon page and started reading. I remember you, and holy crap, it grabs you right out of the start. <laughs> that was that was a, a fun, twisty one to write. I'll tell you. It, uh, it, uh, 
when when you when you when you when you kill off someone in the in the first chapter and then bring her back to life, I always figure that's that that's a good start. So yeah, I'm not sure I've uh, actually seen that happen before, but and I know it's a little bit preemptive, but uh, man, if you want to come back around and talk about that book, I'd have to read it first. But yeah, we can certainly talk about it. There we go. All right, I've completely forgotten where I was. Um, going down a couple of different rabbit holes. I know what it was. Every photograph I have seen of you, you're standing somewhere in the cold. Now, either uh, you, I know you live in Minnesota, right? Right. Yep. 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 Is it truly winter all year round? Well, you know, there's a couple weeks in July that are, are not bad. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> We're actually in the midst of them right now. It's going to be 90 degrees today. So it it, it, see, it does warm up occasionally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, wife and I went out to uh, uh, Minneapolis recently. First time I'd ever been there. What a lovely city. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I don't know what I was expecting, but it was lovely. Anyway, all right. But now, yeah, I, the, uh, the, the, the story behind my author photograph with, with, I think it's got the red flannel shirt on it. It was actually about two degrees when I did that photo shoot. And <laughs> so I, I was, I was trying not to let my teeth chatter while they were taking pictures. And I promptly went home and then threw out my back because my muscles were so cold. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Well, you we're going to, su- you got to suffer for your art, you know? Yeah. Well, that's, that's what it's called. Now, as a bit of background, a lot of times I will find, you know, of course, authors, uh, who are writing about military thrillers served in the, you know, in the armed forces and, or they, if it's a, if it's a cop book, they were a detective at one time. And so I always like to find out, okay, what's Brian's story. And the only thing I could find is that you were director of marketing and PR for an international law firm called uh, Fager and Benson. I'm thinking. Right, right, right. And yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a storyteller, but I don't, uh, I, I don't have those specific experiences in the, in the military or the police. Um, and, you know, I mean, obviously I, I, I do research on such things. And the nice thing is the more books you write, the more you have readers that, that show up with particular expertise in, in various areas that are, are very happy and generous about sharing their wisdom. So that, that helps a lot, but, uh, but, you know, my, my focus is on the storytelling side. In fact, I always, I always tell aspiring writers, you know, who are, they, they, they kind of tell me, oh, I'm going to go off and do the FBI training course or this or that. And I said, well, you know, that's, that's great. And, and, you know, that's, that's terrific to do that kind of stuff, but just remember, you know, and at the end of the day, your, your job is not, you know, to be a policeman, your job is not to be a, you know, a, a, a Navy SEAL or an FBI special agent, you are a storyteller and that's what the reader's looking for. You know, and that's an awesome thing for you to say. And I appreciate the fact, I mean, having now sold, uh, you know, 46 countries, 22 languages, almost two dozen books, you have, you, you give the illusion uh, as any good storyteller were, uh, would is that you were there and you're, you're kind of reiterating, uh, something that I had a conversation with someone recently. And that is, you know, our, our gift, our talent is storytelling. We don't have to have studied all those things. If you're a right. good researcher now, right. Right. if if you're going to, if you're going to write a military thriller and you, uh, you pull a bonehead move with the caliber of a gun, your readers are going to go, David, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 No, that, that's exactly right. And there, there are certain areas that, you know, honestly, you, you, it helps an awful lot to have specific background. I mean, if you're talking about an, an area of, of uh, the genre where there's really, you know, detailed knowledge necessary, and that, that, that might be true of, you know, medical thrillers or, or legal thrillers as well. Um, you're, you're certainly skating a fine line there uh, if you're coming from the outside. So, um, but, you know, I don't write military thrillers and we've got a lot of great, you know, great writers out there who do. So I figure, well, and I, 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 I wish them well. So. Yeah. And I would say, would you call your thriller pretty much all psychological thrillers, right? My own thrillers? Yeah, I would, I would say they're, they're pretty much, they're pretty much psychological thrillers. Exactly. And let's do this just for uh, shits and giggles. If you were telling this to someone who did not know, who is not wrapped up in the writing world, how would you describe, okay, uh, Billy, a psychological thriller is? Yeah, it's uh, uh, it, it's a story that's still going to be, uh, you know, propelling you through the narrative, forcing you to turn the pages, uh, getting you to stay up until three in the morning to find out what happens next. Uh but by the time you get to that last twist, 
you're also so deep inside the heads of the characters that um, you're 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 sharing the whole experience with them, whether it's the hero, whether it's the villain. You're that much in sync with the emotions of the characters that they really become a part of your life. Excellent. And you know, going back to this uh, director of marketing PR, I, what I wanted to ask, uh, what was that like? And more specifically, what did you learn that has helped your writing career from that job? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll I'll tell you first of all my uh, my my favorite story about being a director of marketing at a at a law firm. I, I remember I was going home on the bus one day and I was chatting with this woman and she said, "Oh, so you know what do you do?" And I said, "Oh, I uh, I work at Fagery and Benson. It's a law firm downtown." And uh, she looked at me rather suspiciously and said, "Oh, so you're a lawyer?" And uh, I just laughed and said, "No, no. It, it's even worse. I do public relations for lawyers." <laughs> She, she did not laugh. She looked at me dead serious and said, you're right. That is worse. <laughs> wow. So I, I, think, I think it was right around that time I really started kind of getting serious about, you know, getting, getting words on the page and, uh, and, and getting that book written. So, um, but, you know, the reality is it was, it, was a, it was a great place to work. It was a great team of people. And I learned a lot about storytelling working at a law firm. And the fact of the matter is I, I talked to a lot of litigators there and the litigators were very open about the fact that when it comes to jury trials, the lawyer who's the best storyteller wins. You, you tell the best story, that's what the jury's going to respond to. And so I, I learned a lot from them about, you know, kind of their storytelling craft. I never thought about that. I just watched, um, the new episode or the series Lincoln Lawyer, which uh, yeah. I think it was on. Yeah. And, um, I was just pulled into his storytelling and I never really thought, I always thought it was the power of persuasion more than storytelling in that if you can, you know, more along the lines of a good salesman. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but it, it feels kind of like that, doesn't it? A little bit, a little bit. And yet the, the, the fact is, particularly, um, you know, in, in litigation, so many of uh, so many of the, the, the areas of litigation are very, very technical. There's a lot of detail that goes into it. It's really easy to sort of lose a jury in, in the, the, the details and, and technical minutia. And the, the litigators would always say, you know, you have to cut through that. You need to be able to connect with them on an emotional basis and, and make the story resonate for them as people. And ultimately, that's what I'm trying to do in my thrillers as well. Yeah. Well, mission accomplished. Uh, I'm going to make a little play here because I do, uh, I serve both YouTube channel and uh, my podcast, which is audio only. So I'm going to do some things here uh, visually so that people can really appreciate the, a lot of your uh, body of work, but you got uh, almost two dozen books here. So we got uh, Jonathan Stride series, yep. the Frost Easton series, Cab Bolton series, Five standalones and now three Jason Bourne books. First of all, golf clap. <laughs> Second of all, at 29 years old, how have you been able to manage to write so many books? <laughs> oh, you're so kind. You're so kind. <laughs> you know, it's it's when I think back to the beginnings of my, you know, Jonathan Stride series, which those were the first five books that I did. Uh, that the first Stride novel, I think, came out when I was, what, 42, 43. And uh, I will say Stride has pulled off a, a pretty amazing trick because when I started writing the Stride series, uh, 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 Stride was older than me. And now here we are almost 20 years later, and I'm quite a bit older than Stride. So that, that's, a, that's a nice trick he's pulled off. I wish I knew how he did that. Yeah. And I know this question is much akin to, uh, you know, asking your who's your favorite child, but do you have a favorite series and or character in your repertoire? And, and this could be inside the born world or outside, but I'm just curious. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. You know, I, I've heard that from readers for from year, for years. You know, what what's your favorite book? You know, who's your favorite character? And and I always really struggled with that for exactly that you know uh, issue that it, it is kind of like trying to pick your favorite favorite child. Um, but honestly, I've I've written there are two books that I've written in the the past few years: uh, uh, the Deep Deep Snow and the Ursulina, um, which are technically both standalones and yet also fit together hand in glove to the extent that I almost think of them as one 
long novel, one long project. Uh, the Deep Deep Snow was a finalist for the Edgar Award. The Ursulina just came out in in um, hardcover and ebook this year. It was an audio original last year for Audible. Um, and they're they're both written in first person in a female narrative voice. Two different female narrators uh, in the book. I, I always say that the Deep Deep Snow is the story of a daughter and the Ursulina is the story of a mother. And um, those two books, uh, two very, very different kinds of stories. And yet um, they just go to my heart uh, in a way that it, it just, there's something special about those books for me. And uh, I, I, I look back on those novels and I think, yeah, those, those are the, those books are the reason that I do what I do. So those, uh, uh, those ones are my favorite right now. Now, who knows, uh, next book I write, I may, I may say, nope, nope, that, that's my favorite. Cause for every year it felt like the, 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 the next book I wrote, that would be my favorite. Cause I was so close to the story, but the deep, deep snow and the Ursulina, I, I love those two books and, and they're a great way to discover my approach to storytelling too. Okay, you just anticipated my next question because that's really kind of why I brought it up because everybody has, they got a secret favorite of theirs. And, and what I like to do is <clears throat> I know that if you have a favorite in your repertoire, then you're, uh, I, I want to know what that is because I'm probably going to go straight to that and go, I'm I'm going to read his very best work. You know, as though, watch this, as though I only had time to read one of your books because having now read Born Sacrifice and not having read your other Borns, I, and I don't want to jump it because I got enough stuff to say about that, but I'm like, what well, I got to read, and, and this is no hyperbole, I have to read more of your work now. So there. Yeah, and and that's that's one of the advantages of having done a, a number of standalones over the the past several years. Now it, it gives readers a, a good opportunity to kind of dive in and and you know experience my work. Um, you know, and what what's been fun for me over the last few years is just the sheer diversity of stories and characters I've been able to work on. I mean, you know, on, on one hand, I can be writing one of my, you know, stride novels, more police procedural, or I can be writing these very intense emotional thrillers like The Deep, Deep Snow and The Ursulina. And I can put that down and pick up, you know, the action-driven, adrenaline-focused Bourne novels. It, it's just been a lot of fun being able to explore all those different sides of, of, uh, of storytelling. And uh, I've really enjoyed that. So... I'm trying to figure out the numbers here. Are are you working on, I'm going to guess you're working on probably two books a year, right? It's been three the last several years. Yeah. Holy moly. Now, you yeah, know, for I, I confess this year, I think I'm on track to on, only quote unquote do two. I feel like I'm slacking off a bit, but the, uh, the last few years, it was, it was three a year for, I think the last three or four years. That is no easy feat. Now I've talked to people who are, <clears throat> you know, I'm one book a year, period. Then I'm reading, I'm talking to folks who are doing two and three and sometimes four. And I'm like, all right, well, you, you know what it is? It, it comes down to discipline. I, I have to just, I have to think having written some books myself, if, if you have the discipline to set aside the time and plan accordingly, you can do it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's really about knowing, you know, knowing your own schedule and 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 what you can accomplish and, and what you need to do to, to stay on deadline. There's no way that I could have been doing this back, you know, in the in the early years of my writing career. I mean, I was just, you know, building a familiarity with my craft. And and uh, it's because I've been, you know, doing this for almost 20 years and I've, I've you know, produced almost 2000 books that I've got a comfort level now that that lets me do it. But it's still hard. It's, it's just crazy some days. <laughs> And um, I've read two blurbs that came across my desk in the last few uh, weeks, and it's having to tell kind of the two masters of the craft. I mean, Michael Conley said, he called one of your books a page turner of the highest caliber. I got deep respect for Michael Conley. I mean, the guy is prolific. So there's that one. The second one that blew my mind was to have Nelson DeMille tell you, you know, call you a first rate storyteller. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I gotta, I gotta tell you a good, a good Nelson DeMille story here. Uh, I, uh, I got an email from a reader, oh, a few months ago, a uh, retired police officer and uh, happened to be a retired police officer from the town where Nelson lives. And uh, he said, you know, I, I, I've been meaning to tell you this story for years as to how I got into your books. And he said, um, uh, years and years ago, um, he, uh, he actually, he and his partner got called on uh, a, a call to Nelson DeMille's house because an alarm had gone off at the house. 
And uh, he said, protocol is when an alarm goes off, you have to you know, go inside and check the property, make sure everything's secure. So they were inside Nelson DeMille's house, uh, checking to make sure everything was okay. And they were in DeMille's bedroom. And, uh, uh, and there on his nightstand, he had a copy of my first book, Immoral. <laughs> and, and the police officer said, you know, I figured if it was good enough for Nelson, then it was good enough for me. So he went out, bought a copy of Immoral. Uh, he read it, loved it, had been a fan all these years ever since. So I thought, <laughs> that, that's, that's one of the best stories I've ever heard. <laughs> oh my God, dude, you can't top that. <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> Man. All right. Let's get to this puppy dog. All right, Brian, if you know anything, if you listen to the show at all, um, you know, I do a whole lot of reading and uh, I, I don't, no one has called me, is hyperbolic a word? I know if you were a person of hyperbole, would you be hyperbolic? I think you would, yes. No, okay. So I don't want to be hyperbolic, but this book, um, two words, holy crap. This is one of those books that I, first of all, I loved it. And while reading it, it was, and I can't say this about every uh, book of this caliber, it, I felt like I was watching Matt Damon in a Bourne movie. Interesting. Maybe it's because I am a hardcore Jason Bourne fan and have watched all of the movies, or what, four of them now, right? So, so many times it's kind of embarrassing. I don't know why. It To me, he's like, um, he's like a, an everyday James Bond, right? And this book delivers just that kind of a thrill. Matter of fact, here's my, here's my, almost like I'm doing a review. Action scenes, intense and believable. Characters, multidimensional. And it's, you, I literally didn't want the book to end. A lot of books, because I'm on a time limit and I'm preparing for shows, I'm like, geez, could this just get going? It's, you know, it's 600 pages now, but I didn't want this to end. So, I'm putting this on my top 10 summer 22 reads. Well, I, I really appreciate that. And, and uh, I, I think you put your finger on a couple things that are really important to me with, with the Bourne novels. Uh, um, one is that um, there are, there have been so many iterations of Jason Bourne over the years. I mean, you figure Ludlum wrote the Bourne identity all the way back in 1980. So, you know, here we are, you know, 42 years later. Um, and, and, and I gotta tell you, I, I read, I read the Bourne identity all the way back in 1980 when I was what, 17 years old. And if you had told me that, you know, 40 years later, 40 years later, uh, books would be coming out with my name and Ludlum's name on, on the cover. I would have said, Oh, that's just, that's just crazy. Um, so, you know, you had three Ludlum Bourne novels. You had, I think, 10 or 11 Eric von Lusbader Bourne novels. You've got all of the Matt Damon movies. Um, and I'm, I may be one of the few people who remember that before Matt Damon was Jason Bourne, uh, Richard Chamberlain was actually Jason Bourne in, in an NBC miniseries with Jacqueline Smith as Marie St. Jacques. So, uh, oh, so I, wow. I've got my I've got my my born cred here, but um, but that's one of the things that I think creates a challenge because you have a lot of people that have very different ideas of who born is, and what I wanted to do was create a version of born that would be very very authentic to Ludlum's original vision, and put him in the modern era and create all new plots and characters around him, and yet do it in a way that people that have different visions of born, like the Matt Damon version would still feel like they, they're, they're, they're like dropped down into the middle of that series. And they can very readily picture, if they want to picture Matt Damon as born, it flows naturally into the, into the story. Um, the other thing is you mentioned the, 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 the dimensions of the characters. And one of the things that uh, was, was sort of interesting for me is, I mean, you, you, you talked about the fact that I write, you know, very psychological thrillers. They're very inside the heads of the characters, which, you know, some readers may go, well, you know, why do they have this, this psychological thriller guy writing, you know, the, the action adrenaline driven Bourne series. But I think one, what makes Bourne so distinctive as a hero is that is he's fractured psychologically. You know, he, he's lost his memory. He's struggling with this, this very fundamental sense of who is he as a man and, and what's the, the nature of his morality. That's, that's right inside my wheelhouse. And that's what I really enjoy working with, with the Bourne character is exploring that sort of ongoing struggle he has of, of the kind of man he truly is. 
Well, it you know to to say the phrase page turner seems nearly cliche, but uh, there is a chase scene. I I don't remember exactly where it is. I I meant to put a marker in it, but boy, it's you're nearing the end of the book, and there's a chase scene that just if your palms aren't sweating, I don't think your heart is beating. That's all I'm gonna <laughs> say. But I want to drill down on this idea of being welcomed into the Ludlam legacy, and you know. When you were approached, did you uh, do you recall what it is you thought and and maybe what you were asked at the time? I don't. How far would that have been back? Yeah, that would have been whoa, coming up on coming up on four years now. Um, I, I got a call from my agent um, to let me know that that Putnam had taken over the the Bourne series with the estate and and they were looking for for a new author to kind of reboot the series. And uh, was I interested in tossing my hat into the ring? Jeez. And uh, so, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I've been a Ludlam fan my whole life and, and uh, you know, a huge Bourne fan. And uh, I said, yeah, let's 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 give it a try. Uh, and uh, gosh, I think it was probably four months of, of radio silence went by and, you know, didn't hear a word. Uh, and I just assumed they would decided to go another way, which is fine. I'm sure there were lots of authors that were interested in the opportunity. And uh, uh, then my agent called back and, uh, and, uh, and said five words that will live in my memory for a long time. Uh, Putnam wants you for born. And um, so, uh, uh, so I called uh, Tom Colgan over at Putnam and, uh, and, and kind of talked about, you know, my vision for, uh, for for how I would approach Born, and um, you know, very much the way I was talking about the idea that I really wanted to go back to Ludlum's original character without being tied down to everything that had been done with Born in the past. Because if you look back at Ludlum's books, you're you're in the the Watergate and Vietnam era, and if right. you look at the Matt Damon movies, they've kind of taken them in a whole different direction, which was what Eric did in his books as well. I said, you know. I just think we need to start over, sort of reboot the series from the ground up, um, but but keep the born character very true to life um, for uh, for Ludlam fans and and for Matt Damon fans. Um, you know, Tom loved that idea, and and I kind of mapped out how I wanted to approach it uh, in in you know the first you know uh, of my born books, which is the born evolution. And um, I did a few sample chapters, and uh, he ran all that by the estate and. Um, they loved the direction that I wanted to take the character and, uh, and we were off to the races and, uh, you know, and one of the things that I, I really feel great about is that when, when the born evolution was done and, uh, and Tom passed it along to the estate, um, they came back and said, you know, we don't want to change a word. So, uh, that, that's, that's exactly what you want to hear. Um, wow. because, uh, it, it, uh, and, and, you know, with, with the born sacrifice publishers weekly was, uh, saying, uh, you know, Freeman is a worthy successor to Ludlam. Well, you know, there's, there, there are a few, few compliments that, that, uh, are, are, are nicer for a thriller writer than something like that. Yeah, that's, that's pretty stunning. And I just got to meet Tom Colgan at Thriller Fest a couple of, you know, a few weeks back and a delightful guy and talking about the, uh, guy that sits on top of the mountain with, <laughs> I, I don't know how he does it. He's got so many different franchises that he's working right. on and he's, he's so monster talented and he must just spend his entire day reading. I mean, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so. um, such a fantastic, uh, such a fantastic book. I, I, uh, I don't know if this is a kooky question or, but I, it's like as Writing as Ludlum, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. how do you feel like that differs? And and I want this. Uh, this is aimed primarily for my writing uh, listeners. Is there a different? How do you approach it differently from, say, Jonathan Stride? You know, uh, uh, as far as method and so forth. Yeah, no that that's that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, Ludlum had such a very distinctive prose style. It was a very a very dramatic, very propulsive kind of pro style. Uh, it it, it kind of had a breathless quality to it. Um, and I think that because it was so distinctive, if, if you try to imitate the Ludlum style, it winds up feeling more like a caricature. Um, and yet at the same time, if I just completely write in my own style, I think it feels, you know, just like a Brian Freeman book and not like, you know, a Robert Ludlum, Brian Freeman book. So I, I have kind of a hybrid that that's a little Ludlum and a little me. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking through the prose in such a way that I'm, I'm just trying to let, you know, 
echoes of Ludlam kind of, you know, come through my style. And, and so I think what you get is something that's, that's um, not exactly him, not exactly me, but this, this new combined entity that, um, that has qualities of that, that Ludlam propulsive style, and yet also has the sort of, you know, um, you know, psychological depth of the characters that, that I like to bring to, to my books as well. And so, you know, I, in the beginning, I didn't know, was that going to work? Um, but I, I've been thrilled from, you know, to hear from so many readers that, uh, uh, that have, have really loved, you know, what has come out of that. And, uh, and, and hopefully it, uh, it feels like a, a, a Ludlum novel, uh, even though the style is just not, you know, pure Ludlum, because again, if, if you try to do that, I think it, it would, it would end up feeling false. Yeah. And, and speaking of your, uh, readers, do you ever sit this? I, I find this so curious for uh, a number of different reasons. Do you ever read your reviews? You know, I, I, I learned all the way back in, in 2005 with my first book, Immoral, that, uh, it is, it is psychologically a very unhealthy thing to, uh, <laughs> to read, to read your reviews, uh, because, you know, I mean, you can get, you know, 200 people, you know, putting out five-star reviews and loving the book. And, and there's, there's one person that, that hates it. And, you know, which, which one do you think you're going to focus on as a human the one, being? Yeah. The one that hates it. Yeah. It's of course, of course, exactly. You know, and, and, you know, I think, Every writer wants every reader to be, you know, totally happy and loving the book. And you know, the fact is, the reason we have so many different authors and genres and, and different approaches to storytelling is, is because we have so many different readers who are interested in, in different things and are looking for different things in their novels. So there's there's always going to be folks that will read and go, nah, that's just not for me. Well, that's perfectly fine. But it means that, you know, I, it's just... You know, I, I I typically steer clear of that, and uh, if 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 there's a great review out there that that uh, you know that I should probably see, you know, my 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 wife will will see it and kind of screen it for me and say, yeah, take, take a look at this one. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that is about our uh, psyche, and you being a psychological thriller expert, you should be able to. I should practically call you Doctor Friedman uh, <laughs> I, as I get on your couch, but I wonder why we do that. Is it? Is is it that we're so hungry for the accolade, or we 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 just gonna fake? We're gonna focus on that one thing that that one pebble in our shoe that we can't seem to shake. I mean, I, I just find that so curious. I know it, it it is a strange part of human nature, but it is. I've I've talked to enough writers and and enough artists in other you know uh, other media that have exactly the same experience. That I think it's just it's just a pretty common problem for creative types. And I think, you know, I mean, I think most writers tend to be sort of neurotic creatures at heart. And, uh, and, and I always tell aspiring writers that, you know, the, the, the biggest challenge you are going to face is not from editors or agents or publishers or readers. The challenge is going to come from inside you because a, a writer is always his own worst enemy. And, and you have to kind of stare down that internal voice that says, well, yeah, you may have written, you know, two dozen novels, but this time, you know, you're, you're just not going to be able to do it. And, and uh, you need to be able to kind of, you know, stare that part of yourself down and realize, you know what, you, you can, you can make this happen. I've got a question. I noticed <laughs> that um, born here, for instance, is uh, through Putnam, Yep. But I could have sworn, am I right in this, that your standalone thriller that we're coming up in August, again, to <laughs> give you an uh, extra plug on that, is that, uh, I want to say that's Thomas Mercer, isn't it? Yeah, I've, I've got relationships with um, four different publishers, which is, um, it, it's kind of fun um, because they all have different ways of approaching their audiences and they're looking for different stories. So uh, a number of my standalones have come out through Thomas and Mercer. Uh, you know, obviously Putnam's doing the Bourne novels. Um, my Jonathan Stride novels are being published by Blackstone. Um, and they're also doing the, um, the print editions of my Audible originals. I also have a relationship with Audible. So the Deep, Deep Snow and the Ursulina, those came out as Audible originals. And now Blackstone has taken over the, the print and e-editions of those. Okay, couple of questions here. And, and the reason I ask this is because, again, so many of my listeners are uh, up and coming writers such as myself. And we wonder, is, so is that pretty standard operating procedure to have multiple publishing houses move variety um, books? I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's becoming a little bit more common. It was not particularly common, you know, when I, when I started doing this. Um, but uh, I, I really felt it was, it was good from a creative standpoint and, and good from a marketing standpoint. I mean, I think the, the days when, 
you know, a, a, an author would stick with one publisher for his entire career and, and put out a book a year and, and, and you know, there you, there you go. Um, that really has not been a workable model for, for a while now in, in the publishing industry. And, and so I felt that, you know, so many publishers have, you know, waves uh, of, of, you know, success that, um, you know, if that having multiple relationships from a marketing standpoint was a, was a, a more secure way to approach the industry. So that if one publisher starts to have issues, you, you, you're not, that's not, you haven't got all your eggs in one basket. You also have other relationships that can kind of take up the slack. That's the best phrase right there. Not all your eggs in one basket. And I hadn't thought about that, but you really are in the best possible position because you're uh, diversifying risk. Right. Exactly right. That, that is exactly right. So I'm, I'm going to take five seconds and, and, uh, and do something really important. I'm, I'm going to release the cat from my office. Cause go I'm right ahead. <laughs> Okay, this is a good time to take a short break. And when we come back, we'll hear about Brian Freeman's secret sauce. Stay with us. Your host, David Temple here. Hey, before we get back to the show, I thought I would throw in this one quick note. I have had authors approach me who want to actually advertise on the show. And I'm like, that's cool. I love that idea. I mean, think about it. We feature the best thriller writers in the world. You're one of the new up-and-coming thriller writers in the world to be, and you have a book coming out. Our rates are super reasonable. (laughs) We're easy to work with, as you know, and we all want to work together to make success for all of us. Just reach out to us here at The Thriller Zone at thethrillerzone at gmail.com. Let's talk rates. Let's talk details. Let's do something together in the new year. I think you'll like it. Now, back to the show. Hey there, I'm Brian Freeman, author of The Born Sacrifice, and I'm hanging out with David Temple in The Thriller Zone. Your favorite authors, The Thriller Zone. And now, back to the show. For fear of sounding like Captain Obvious, uh, I read somewhere that that you're known for those You Are There settings. Again, back to describing to someone who may not be familiar with that how would you how would you best describe that well yeah setting is is so important in in thrillers i mean it really enriches the drama of what's going on so you're always looking to have the location of a chapter in reinforce what's going on inside that chapter and so i want readers to um, be able to feel as if they've been dropped down in the middle of every chapter and they can hear it and touch it and feel it and sense it happening all around them like they're invisible observers. And um, so that's that's an important part of, of creating the book. Um, you know, so in, in, you know, for a lot of years, what I would do is typically I'd be visiting all the locations in person and, and you know, it, being there allows you to really feel what it's like to be in that area. And it's not just a question of physical senses. It's also a question of, I, I call it the six senses of place, because there's this additional layer of what emotions does a location evoke and, and how do you feel when you are in there? What, what kind of what's going through your head? If you can capture that, then I think the, it's going to really come alive for the reader. Um, but it's, it's been trickier the last few years because, of course, you know, thanks to, to COVID, um, you know, a, a lot of us have not exactly been able to, to do on-site research in the same way that, uh, that we'd like to. So uh, I've, I've been able to sort of figure out alternate ways of, of researching locations. And it helps, you know, having done this for enough years that, you know, at that, you know, that feels okay. I'd still love to be, you know, walking down the street of every, you know, location that, that's, you know, occurring in a born book or, or one of my other books, but uh, you know, it's, it's now at a point where in, in the world that, that just hasn't proven practical. So, you know, you brought up a really good point. I've never thought about it this way, but it is that sixth evident sense that is uh, that feeling that, uh, in, that almost this intuitive feeling like, Oh, I, whether it's I've been here before or this area makes me feel like this. And that's something, you know, you can do Google flyovers and research your, ears off. But if you don't really exist inside of it, it, right? it's that extra little bit that brings it alive. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, I've, I've enjoyed watching the evolution of your book covers back to uh, my book cover uh, gaping uh, is there's a great evolution. And as I was, I got to the end, I'm like, okay, Brian, oh yeah, season of fear. Oh yeah, turned this down. Oh, yeah. And then I get all the way to the end and I'm like, the agency by 
Ali O'Brien. <laughs> Wait, is that a misprint? Well, who is, what is that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Year, years ago, this is going back, I think, to 2009. Um, I, uh, I, I actually, um, my agent at that time was, uh, was based in London, and uh, she'd always wanted to write a book set in the, the wild and woolly London publishing industry. And, uh, but she wasn't a writer, so she came to me and said, hey, you know, would, would you ever consider teaming up on a, on a book? And, uh, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for a creative challenge. I thought it sounded like fun. So I, you know, I came up with the, the plot and wrote the book and, and she offered her feedback. And, and we, we, we used a combination of our, our, two, uh, our two names for the author. Author. So she was Allie. So, and I was Brian. So Allie O'Brien became the author and, uh, you know, we got a great response. It was reviewed, you know, got a great review in people magazine and, uh, had, had a lot of fun with it. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it was, a, it was, it was practically, you know, what they call chick lit. I mean, it was more of a, 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 you know, funny, you know, romance. Um, and, uh, I, actually wrote a second book, um, kind of a sequel to it called West 57, which you can actually find out uh, online under the name BN Freeman. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it was hard because um, not long after uh, the agency came out, uh, my, my lovely agent, Allie, uh, passed away very suddenly uh, and unexpectedly. So um, it, it, I wasn't even sure I wanted to do another book because, you know, the, the agency was so wrapped up in, in my relationship with Allie. But uh, I felt like, you know, West 57 was, it was already in my head and, and it was sort of a, a tribute to Allie to write the follow-up book as well. So, um, so yeah, that was how, that was how I, I, I dipped my toe in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in that side of the business. So sex in the city meets the devil wears Prada. Pretty much that, exactly yeah. right. That's exactly right. <laughs> I love it. Well, and that, that was going to be my next question, which is kind of how it teed it up is like, if you were to ever stop and not do this very specific genre that you have nailed, do you have a secret ambition even to do something completely off the reservation under a pen name, et cetera? Yeah. You know, I mean, for me, I, you know, I, I, I have been, I have been blessed to have an amazing, you know, you know, career in publishing over the last two decades. And, and at this point, I, I take on projects because they sound like fun. I mean, you know, the idea of, of taking over the Bourne series, I mean, that just sounded like a hell of a lot of fun. And, yeah. and it was. I mean, this has been some of the most entertaining writing that I have done, you know, in my whole career. It's just, it's just a great, great honor. So for me, going forward, uh, yeah, I, I, I would love to be able to dip my toe into other you know, other genres as well. I, I could see myself, you know, you know, trying historical fiction. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't mind writing nonfiction. I, I could see uh, hooking up with someone to, on, you know, to write, help them write their, you know, memoir or autobiography. Uh, there, there's all sorts of different things I'd like to try. I just love, you know, I just love telling stories. That's what I'm in it for. And uh, so being able to explore other aspects of that. Uh, and to me, that sounds great. Yeah. Well, I love that. Before we get to our um, infamous rapid fire questions, I have a question that I always like to ask all my authors, uh, visiting authors is this. If you were to offer a single piece of advice for either an up and coming writer or someone who's considering it perhaps as a uh, profession, what would that piece of advice be? And it doesn't have to be just one thing, but uh, kind of that catch all. Well, the first thing I always tell aspiring writers, and, and it sounds obvious, but um, uh, one hundred percent of unwritten books have never been published, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know it, it. It seems it seems like an obvious thing, and yet, as, as I said earlier, uh, I think for for so many writers, whether it's established writers or aspiring writers, we're our own worst enemy. And I, I can't tell you how many aspiring writers I've talked to and heard from who who will get you know fifty pages of a book done. Uh, and then just walk away from it. You know, they'll 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 feel like, oh, you know, it's it's just no good. It's not going where I want it to go. Um, and and again, it's that voice in your head that just keeps telling you, oh, I I can't do this. And and that's the voice that you've got to silence. And and you've got to figure out that you know ultimately at some point there's there's going to be a, a relationship between you know the the keyboard and your backside and some super glue uh, because uh, you're you're going to have to just sit down and keep writing. Uh, and and I tell folks, look. You know, don't don't question yourself as you start writing. Don't constantly reread and edit those opening pages. Keep going. Keep telling the story because when you get to the end of the story, odds are you're going to go back and realize, hey, you know, th those pages that I thought those were those were no good. Actually, yeah, that was that kind of works for me. So uh, that's what it's all about. You you, you got to believe in yourself and you got to keep going and get that get that first book done. 
It is funny though, isn't it? Is it, it's the uh, it's the monkey mind. It's the guy on the shoulder that's doing the judgment. That really, it's not based in reality. That's oh. one thing I have to always tell myself. That's just an emotional hit. You're feeling weak or insecure. That's all that is. It's because you you've put the time in. You've put the words down. Take a breath, walk away, right? Come back. Yeah. yeah. And and I, and, I, and I don't care whether you're working on your first novel or you're working on your your 25th. Uh, I'll tell you, it never goes away. I mean, it, it's just, it's still a part of the way the writer's brain is wired. And and I have as much, you know, you know, nerve wracking, you know, doubts and challenges, you know, 20 years into this business that I had when I was getting started. It, it's just, that's, that's, I think that's part of the, the, the creative experience. And you have to sort of learn that, you know, to, to use that to your advantage and realize that, you know what, that, that self doubt is actually going to end up making a better book because you're, you're just going to, you know, demand, you know, higher standards from yourself. It makes me think of that phrase when they say, when people go, Oh, do you ever get writer's block? And I'm like, you might hit a bump, but you know, uh, how about getting up from the desk and walking away and walking the dog or having a lunch and coming back because cops don't get cops block or, you know, firemen don't get fireman's block. I mean, yeah, I, you know, right. Writer's block kind of gets in the way of my eating, uh, you yeah. know, if, <laughs> if, I, if I don't, if I don't publish a book, you know, well, I'm not making any money. So yeah, yeah. It, it is, you, you can't, you can't let that kind of stuff stop you. And, you know, I've learned that I don't, I, I don't call it writer's block. I, I have what I call tough chapter days where you're just working on a chapter and, you know, it's just not coming together the way you want it to. And, and, you know, your immediate reaction is, well, that, we've had a good run. That's it. Never going to be able to write again. Uh, <laughs> you know, and the next day you go back to it like, oh, okay, here's what you do. And, and it all comes together. So. Yeah. That's, I love that. All right. How about a little uh, rapid fire questions? Really easy. When writing, Brian, do you prefer a loud, hyperactive, caffeine riddled coffee shop or perhaps someplace quiet like a library or a home office? Uh, you know, actually both. I, I switch it up quite a lot. And uh, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll write in the quiet of my office. Sometimes I'll write outside. Sometimes I'll pick up my laptop and, and go to a coffee shop. And uh, sometimes if I'm writing a scene where there's music involved, I'll actually have my headphones on and I'll be playing the music that's in the scene as I'm writing that chapter. So oh, I love that. Okay. Number two, as for discipline, do you prefer banging out an exhaustive outline before you sit down to craft the masterpiece or do you have a basic idea and just wing it? Uh, it's again, it's kind of in the middle. Uh, I, I do an outline, but uh, it's much less intense than it used to be in my early books. I, I, I see it now as sort of more of a road mode roadmap of, you know, I'm here's here's where I'm starting. Here's where I'm going. And there's some kind of mileage posts along the way. Uh, but I don't like to, to sort of lock myself into a structure because even though I know who's doing what to whom and why, um, I like to be able to massage the suspense and the story as I'm going. It's so amazing how many conversations with, I mean, we're now, you'll be our 76th, I suppose, or 77th episode, and how many conversations I've had about this very topic. And and they generally are polar opposites. Oh, no, I, I write by the seat of my pants. Oh, no, I outlined the bejesus out of it. And uh, very few people, I would say you're you're probably right there in the middle. So you have a good structure, but you don't get tied to it because, yeah. and I think this is part of the magic of being a great organic storyteller is I bet you, Brian, you are still surprised by some of the things that are happening, right? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And you know, you, you learn to be able to, to, to sense where the drama is as you're going and, and you, you know, when you need to change things around and things that seem like they're going to work when you're doing an outline, when you actually get into the reality of it, it's like, nope, nope, we got to go a different way here. So. I was, uh, my very first uh, couple of books, I winged it, just pure winged it. And then uh, along the way, I thought, well, you know, I hear about this outlining and I did an exhaustive outline, uh, like all the way to the, and then I started writing it. And I personally found myself getting a little bored only because I felt like I had already discovered everything. And now I was just filling in the blank. That's neither here nor there or good or bad. It's just, you know, particular. No, I think that's, I think that's a, that's a, that's a reasonable risk that, um, you know, it, it, you know, that you're, you're right. You don't want your writing style to feel flat if you're just sort of, you know, you know, kind of putting an outline on the, of words on the page. I mean, I, I think you want that spontaneity that comes with, you know, crafting things as you go, but you know, it's, it's different for every writer. 
Exactly. All right. Number three, you and your wife have decided to ditch the cold of Minnesota for a month and just disappear to a nice exotic tropical island somewhere. Let's pretend you would love that. What two or three books would you be taking with you? You might be there a while. (laughs) Uh, You know, I would, uh, if, if I, if I were, you know, I assume we're saying books that I did not write. Uh, Yeah. 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 It's always fun writing, rereading mine too. Uh, I would probably take uh, Nelson DeMille's The Charm School. I think one of the the great, uh, great thrillers of all time. Uh, I'd take uh, In a Dry Season by Peter Robinson, just a magnificent uh, police procedural that, that goes back cuts back and forth between the present and, and World War II. And uh, I think I would, uh, I think I would also take uh, Michael Connelly's Bloodwork, um, which, uh, you know, I mean, I love the Bosch novels, but Bloodwork uh, is still, I think, my favorite of everything he done because the, 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 the solution to what's going on is just so elegantly simple and yet you never see it coming. And that, that's what I always look for in, in, a great, uh, in a great thriller is that the solution to the mystery should, should ultimately have been staring you in the face the whole time and you just never saw it there. That is so hard to do too, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Oh man, all right. Fourth and final, Hollywood producers have come calling, bought the rights to Born Sacrifice and want you to choose a new Jason Bourne. <laughs> so, who would you like to? Who would you pick, and why? Oh boy, uh, that that's a that's a, a tough one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm not going down that rabbit hole. I I, I tell you, I I think uh, I, I'd like to I'd like to take Matt Damon and 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 peel a few years off him and put him back in there. But uh, and you know who knows? I mean, heck, you know, Liam Neeson is still doing thrillers, and he's he must be what eighty five by now. <laughs> So there's no reason Matt couldn't take over for one more. <laughs> yeah. Side note about Liam. He's now doing kind of the same movie over and over again. Yes. 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 And back to Matt, though, I, I Brian, I got to tell you something. I went looking, I went drilling down this morning to find out if Matt's going to come back. And I'm like, to me personally, there is no other Jason but Matt, but that's that's just me. And have you heard one way or the other? Do you have any I, idea? I, I have I have not heard anything. I know that that I think it would it would take an amazing script to get you know Matt on board because I, I I saw interviews where he was not happy with you know the the script for the last movie Jason Bourne. Uh, and uh, so I mean you know my attitude is well I I think he ought to be uh, him uh, you know reading uh, some of the uh, other books that are out there. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, the timing to me would be so perfect. I mean, now it's been quite a few years since we've had a Jason Bourne novel. Uh, I, I think, you know, given Hollywood looking to rebound after the pandemic, uh, getting, a, getting Jason Bourne back in theaters would be a, a tremendous, uh, a tremendous move. Uh, so I, I really hope they're working on it. Yeah, I can't say that his last one was my favorite. No, I, 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 I wasn't terribly crazy about that one. I, I thought... You know the first three, the ones that you know had the the, the Ludlum titles. I thought all three of those were were excellent. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, from your lips to God's ears. Let's cross our fingers. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, folks, to learn more, visit bfreemanbooks.com and follow him on both Twitter and Instagram at the same B Freeman Books. Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. And I hope, you know, I hope we can uh, come back around, maybe chat about I Remember You, hint, hint. Yep. Happy, happy to do it. Actually, if you want to chat a little bit later this year, I'll have both I Remember You out and the next Jonathan Stride novel, The Zero Night, will be out as well. So uh, we can we can compare notes. So. Wait a minute. It's July. You're talking about getting two more out by Christmas. Christmas? Well, they're all done, fortunately. So, uh, oh, but wow. uh, yeah, this has been quite the year. I mean, actually, four book launches this year. The Ursulina came out in in print and e on February first, and now the Born Sacrifice, I Remember You, and the Zero Night all coming out in the space of about three months. So, and one thing I, I just popped back into my mind, and I want to I want to bring this up. So, you said you're working with Blackstone Publishing, yeah. Blackstone Publishing is now one of my favorite new companies. I've been watching them for a while, but I got introduced uh, more deeply by way of Andrews Wilson and then by Rick Blywise, who wrote yep. a book yep. called Pinion Scorpion. Yep. But here's the thing I love. Their attention to detail and quality on both the jackets and the pre- and, and the creation of the book, you think you you may think, oh, it's just a book. No, no, no peel it away and look at some of what's going on underneath, like Hotel California, for instance. Yes. Yep. Yep. 
Holy moly, they have they've taken quality to a whole new level. Yeah, they put out a, a great product. And and it's been really exciting to to see them, you know, evolve over the last few years because Blackstone started out exclusively as an audio publisher. In fact, they've yeah. they've been my audio publisher since the beginning uh with with Immoral. They were my publisher all the way back then. And since they see them moving now and, and having taken over uh, you know, ebook and print books uh, as well, uh that's been a really exciting transition and, and they have they've brought some great authors uh into their catalog. I, I it, they're they're terrific to work with. Yeah, that's what I hear. Just nice, nice things. Well, folks, once again, the book is, and you, you're you going to want to add this to your summertime reading. I promise you, it is, uh, it's on my top 10. But again, Brian, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. The book is The Born Sacrifice, Robert Ludlum's Legacy Continues, and is in good hands with Brian. Folks, before I go, I want to remind you of just two simple things. Number one, Love your emails. Please feel free to email us at any time. Thethrillerzone at gmail.com. That's it. You got a complaint. You got a request. You want to hear about our swag. They're getting ready to open a store soon. You tell me about it. I'll get back to you. I promise. Number two, please do us a favor and subscribe to our YouTube channel. YouTube.com slash thethrillerzone. It helps build an audience. You can also click that little bell and it'll ring, not literally, but it will uh, let you know when new episodes drop. So we love your subscriptions to the show. I can't wait to tell you who's on the next show, but there's a couple of people vying for that position (laughs) and it hasn't been confirmed just yet. So I'm going to leave you in a little bit of suspense and simply say, We'll see you next time for another edition of The Thriller Zone. Your-